Matthew chapter 25. For the king, uh, verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a, okay. Uh, can I just, can I hurry through this because then we can talk? Is that okay? Don't shout at me from the translation booth, please. I'll, just give me, we'll work, we'll trade here. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he, had, uh, then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of the servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, for you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of our Lord. He also, he, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of our Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Don't be a ground talent hider. Look, there you will have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. I wanna start a new series today and over the next whatever period of time, I wanna speak about something that I've titled Stewarding with Divine Purpose. Stewarding with Divine Purpose. When we moved to South from South Africa to the States about 30 years ago, there were changes that took place and it's not just about relocating. The thing about it is, it's, it's, it's not sufficient to sit and say, well, we speak the same language because the culture is different, the environment is different, the regulations are different, the way that everything operates in America is very different, different to the way it was in South Africa. And so if you want to become part of society, you're gonna have to put yourself in a place where you allow the environment in which you find yourself to have influence over who you are. Because what ends up happening is you start to gain a local perspective. You gain a local sense of humor. You gain a local viewpoint on life. Things are different, they're not all the same. One of the examples I used this morning is, if you're in Africa and you feel like putting a deck on your house, what you do is you go out and you find somebody who you think is a great deck builder. And you speak to them and you say, I want a deck on my house. And they say, okay. And so you talk about the design and you talk about the price and you reach agreement and you put it on your house. But when you come to America, things are not that simple. If you decide that you would like a deck on your house, the first thing you have to do is get hold of the homeowners association. And they will let you know if, you th if they think putting a deck on your house is a good thing. Then they will tell you how big the deck should be. And they're also going to let you know what color it should be. And they're probably going to tell you what it needs to be made out of. And when you get through that big hurdle, then you have to go to the county because you have to get a permit. They're not really interested in the permit. They're more interested in your money. They want to know how much money it's going to cost to build that because once you tell them, you're going to get another surprise when your personal property bill rounds comes around next year. There's going to be a fee for your deck. The point is this. When you move from one location to another location, you have to understand how things work. You have to be at a place where you understand the culture, what motivates the culture, how society operates, and what the rules and regulations of that place are. The driving impetus behind society in different cultures. You cannot be at a place where you sit and say, I want to live in America, but I'm going to live like I'm in Africa, because it's not going to work. The same thing happens when we become 
citizens of the kingdom. The moment that you got born again, you left where you were behind and you became a citizen of the kingdom. This starts talking about the fact, it says, for the kingdom of God. If you're a person who's a citizen of the kingdom of God, it's talking to you. What it's starting off by saying is, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what it is to live in the kingdom. And I'm gonna give you some perspective on what it is to be able to take the things of the kingdom and how we live in that environment. What that society is all about, what that culture is all about, what the process of that uh, culture is all about, and how we live successfully as kingdom citizens. There are a few things I want you to notice about this as we kick off. The first thing is this. The master owned the talents. A talent is actually a reference for, it's a, it's a form of currency, it's money. And what it's talking about is, it's filthy lucre, it's money. Spondulix, whatever you wanna call it. But it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for something of value. What he's saying is this, the owner of something of value was the master. And what he did was he took that value, and he said, I'm going to entrust it to you, the servant. He didn't say I'm giving it to you. He said, I'm entrusting it. Because he said, there's going to become a time where I'm coming to ask for it back. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to him. The second thing is this. If you have a look at the servants, the master never said to him, I'm looking for you to take what I give you, I'm looking for you to take the value that I impart to you, and I want you to come back having increased that. He never said anything to them. What he said is, I'm giving you the talent, I'm giving you the value, take care of it for me. How did the servants know that they needed to do something with that? How did they know the servants know that they had to impart and have influence on what had been entrusted to them so that it created a situation of increase? Because they lived in a household where the master was. And when you live in a household where the master is, you understand what the culture of the household is. And if you live in a culture that says, you know what, we're all about productivity, we're all about prosperity, we're all about increase, we're all about life, what it does is it creates a culture in which you live. And so when somebody gives you something, in that culture you're sitting saying, how do I take that, how do I have influence of that, and how do I take that to a place where it translates into increase? The good servants understood culture. The good servants understood it was about increase. It wasn't something that was looked for, it was looked something that was expected because it was part of the culture. When the master came back, what was he looking for? What have you done with what I've given you of value? The responsibility for increase didn't rest with the master, it rested with the servants. The responsibility for increase didn't rest with the master, it rested with the servants. There are too many Christians and they're well-meaning and they're well-intentioned, but the problem is that they're operating as a kingdom citizen, but they're looking for God to do everything in their life. And they don't recognize the fact that God has given them value and God has said, what are you gonna do with it? I have given you everything and I've equipped you with everything necessary to take it and to be able to handle this in a way so that you're able to produce increase. Lots of Christians are disappointed because what they're doing is they're looking for God's intervention in their life and they're waiting for God to do something and God sitting saying, I've enabled you. Unless we take on the responsibility and sit and say, it's my responsibility to understand the culture of the kingdom and to take the principles of the kingdom and put them into operation so that they translate into increase, it's not gonna happen. We'll live with disappointment. We'll live with disappointment. He took something that was of value, and he imparted it, and he gave it to his servants. Everybody here has been given something of value. God has entrusted you with value. I look at my own life. I have a fantastic wife that I love to bits. That's my wife, Rafa. (laughs) That I love to bits. She's great, she's fantastic. She adds so much to my life. She's such a good mother. She's such an upright person. You cannot get a straighter person in your life. She will be honest with you. She is is a great wife. She is valuable to me. I found a wife, I found a good thing. 
I wake up every single morning and I have my kids and I enjoy my kids around me and I look at their zest for life and I look at their enthusiasm as they jump out of bed and it's a new day and they're off to school except for Colton. He wakes up post school. (laughs) But they're excited, they're full of life, they're full of enthusiasm. They're so excited about what they're gonna do. They're so excited about the smallest little things in love, like life. I love watching their little personalities burgeon. I love their sense of humor. I love the fact that all the different kinds of things that they find in life is so fascinating to them and they come home with interesting bits of trivia because they're growing, because my life has been blessed, because I've had something of value imparted to me. You have a citizenship called an American citizenship. It is something that's been imparted to you and given to you as something of value. Do you recognize that? You could have been born in in a a camp in Somalia, a refugee camp in Somalia where there's nothing. A whole bunch of people living, trying to be sustained by governments around the world. What did we do to deserve to be born into a place that affords us opportunities like few other places, or if any, around the world? You have been given value. What are you going to do with it? I'm so tired of hearing about, okay, can I just say this? This is, the, this is the one commercial break during the thing. I'm just gonna say some stuff. If it's relevant for you, take it. Please don't be offended if it isn't. Take it and digest it, and if you think differently and you uh, wanna think differently, that's okay. We'll agree to disagree. But we're all mature, right? Yeah. Right, okay. You've been given citizenship. I'm tired of Christians sitting on the sidelines saying, well, I don't think God's called us to engage in politics. Get into politics. You've been given value. What are you gonna do with your value called your citizenship? Well, I'm not gonna participate. Why? Don't cry when you wake up one day and you find the country in a place potentially that you didn't want it to be. And you sit and say, well, I don't understand why we don't have you know, Christ in schools and I don't understand why we just don't have a government based on, and I don't know why we can't read the Bible. And you know why? Because you never said anything. You have a responsibility when you have value imparted to you to take the value and you to do something with it. And the thing that you have to do with it has nothing to do with what you feel, it has everything to do with kingdom values. Stop listening to the media, because I can tell you now, I am so tired of the racial conflict that happens in this country. Everything is designed to create racial conflict in this country. Let me tell you something, as kingdom citizens, God doesn't look at you and see black and white or green or red or anything else. God looks and he sees a kingdom citizen. That's what he looks at. Stop listening to politicians. They're more interested in your vote than in the truth. And they will tell you some stuff that is designed to rile you and excite you and get you motivated, and it may not be truthful, but it'll get your vote. Be careful what you listen to. You have a responsibility in this country. You've been given something. Take it and you are to honor that and you are to use that in a way that delivers value to your citizenship. Should I tell you something? I'm tired of people getting caught up in skirmishes that they, they make, they, that they miss the plot. We get so caught up in little things here that we miss the big picture. Well, what's happening with this? And what's happening? Forget, take a macro view of things. Have a look at which way the country is going. There are two political parties. What's the big agenda and where is each of those taking the country? Have a look at it. And then sit and say, as a Christian, as a citizen of the kingdom, where am I going to sit and say, I'm supporting that? If you get into the detail of stuff, you're going to get caught in the weeds. You are a kingdom citizen. God has given you something. He's given you something incredible called a citizenship. Enjoy it. I don't care if you woke up on the streets this morning. I don't care if the only thing that you have in your body is life and breath. You have something of value called life and breath. Do something with it. Do something with it. God puts value in your life. God puts value in your life because God wants you to experience what it is that the kingdom is all about. And you have to have a platform of which you can experience it.
Don't talk about the fact that God is, is about increase. That's a good principle, it's a true principle, but how's he gonna demonstrate that in your life? He needs to give you a springboard of which you can realize increase. Well, God is a God who is healed. Yes, God is a God who heals, but he's got to give you a way for you to experience that healing. God is a God of success. God leads us in, into a place of prosperity. That's true, but he's got to give you a springboard so that you can experience that. Otherwise, all you have an, is an idea about the kingdom. It might be a truthful idea, but it's not experiential. The reason he put value in your life and the reason he entrusted you with talents in your life and the reason that he's looking for increases because what he's saying is, I want you to experience the culture of the kingdom every day. And I'm giving you an opportunity to step into it. It's a stepping stone. The blessing you're looking for is in your hands. The problem with us sometimes is we just don't recognize it. God gave you stuff with the intention of stepping into the blessing. He's given you value in your life because the reason he's done that is he's sitting saying to you, I'm giving you an opportunity to take something, I'm giving you the opportunity to take culture, to mix it with that and have influence and a result in increase that you get to participate in. What happens when they, they, they took the talents that were given to them? God said, fine, take those and because you've accomplished, I'm gonna give you more. He's sitting saying, what kind of influence can you have in the things that I've put into your life? You wanna ask more? You are looking for God to put more into your hands? What are you doing with what you've got? This is for all the people on the beach this morning. Those ones who couldn't make it to church because they're on the beach tanning. Part of the problem that we have is that when God gives us value, it doesn't always come wrapped as perfection. When God gives us value, it doesn't always come wrapped as perfection. Sometimes God's gonna give you the seed of value. When my kids were born and they were young, what came with them was the seed of legacy. God never gave me legacy, he gave me the seed of legacy. And every single day when I spend time with my children, and every time I have an opportunity to make deposits into their life, and every single time I model life in front of them, and every single time I'm speaking into their life, I'm investing in legacy. I'm investing in legacy, why? Because he's given me something of value, he's given me a seed of value, and that seed is gonna grow over time. You know what the amazing thing is about God? When you take God and you start operating and you grab hold of value, what ends up happening is you step into process, and as you start delivering value the way that God intended for you to do, you're gonna get caught up in process. And you know what happens when you get caught up in process? Things start happening on the inside of you that establish you and gird you up to be able to handle the end delivery, which is the blessing. Sometimes people want to just get the blessing, but they're not equipped to handle it. You've got to go through process so you can handle that. There are some people that God gives you, you you're creative and you've got incredible ideas. You're innovative. God's going to give you the seed of innovation to come up with ideas and concepts and thoughts. Things that's going to create a new business. And you may have to grow. Where did you think Microsoft came from? A garage. If you've got a garage, you've got potential. <laughs> What's the point? The point is, too many times God will give us a seed of value, but we discard it. And we squander opportunity. And God sitting, God says, well, God's intention is to bless you. God's intention is to bless you. The thing about it is, God doesn't pour money down from heaven. What he does is he positions you in a place and he gives you value so that you can walk into prosperity. And when you squander that silly thought, you've just thrown away your six million bucks. Because somebody else will pick it up. God will hand it on to somebody else. We've got to recognize potential. Sometimes we get into potential and we don't always recognize it because the thing about it is it's not functioning the way that God intended to. 
God may put you in a place and it might be a work environment where your boss is hideous and he's nasty and he's underhanded and he's crooked and he exploits circumstances and situations so that he looks really good at your expense. And you're sitting saying, well, you know what, I'm out of here. I can't wait for the news. And God didn't say that. The thing about it is, have you recognized the value of where you are? Because if you recognize the value of where you are, all of a sudden, once you recognize value, it puts you at a place where you're able to steward it with divine purpose. When you find out why you're there, God will sit and say to you, this is what I want. And then you are there to have influence. The reason you're there to have influence is because you're gonna bring about change. You're the one responsible for handling the talent. You're the one responsible for handling the value. You're the one responsible for increase. He's put you there for a purpose. I don't know what the increase is. Maybe he wants you to learn something there and he'll move you off. Maybe he'll get you at a place where somebody will come and headhunt you. Maybe he'll be at a place where your boss will just leave one day and you'll get promoted. I don't know why you're there. Do you know why you're there? Discover divine purpose. If you understand the value of what's, what's there and why you're doing that, you'll discover purpose. And when you discover purpose, all of a sudden you know why I'm in that environment. I know what it is that I'm supposed to be getting from here. And I know how to do it. And so I don't get caught up in all the other stuff that's dysfunctional around me, that's red herring taking me in every direction. I'm here for this value. When God worked with David, David gave him, a, a, God gave David value in the form of Goliath. A giant. Everybody else would look at it and run away and hide. Because they were petrified of him, because he was so big. And who wants, to, who wants to fight him? The point of it is this, they didn't see the value of it. David, because he killed Goliath, positioned him to become king of Israel. If he never had a Goliath, he wouldn't have been at that place. It was because he killed Goliath that everybody had so much to say about David. Yeah. Everybody spoke about David. Have you heard about David? Did you hear the little one who killed it? And, blah, 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 blah. and the next thing you know, what happens? The king feels shaky. Why? Because he recognized some value in something that other people didn't. And sometimes we lose it because we're so focused on the giant that we didn't see the value. God didn't say he wants you to be distracted by the giant. He said to you, what I want you to do is I want you to identify value and I want you to use it for increase. Find the value. Find the talent he's given you and use it for increase. Moses murdered a man. And God comes and says, Moses, I'm so glad to catch up with you. You know what, Moses? Moses. Do you see the value in your life? And, Ma and Moses is sitting there saying, value? i am killed a man. I'm hiding at the backside of the desert. I don't want anybody to know that I'm around because I'm a wanted man. And God's saying, yes, I know that, Moses, but did you see the value? And he's like, no. What he was talking to Moses about was the fact that you have heritage, you have past, you have history, you grew up in Egypt, you had connections, you met with royalty, you spent time in that place. If there's anybody who has the ability to move into that space and have a relationship and have a, 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 a negotiation on equal footing, it would be somebody like you, Moses. But he didn't see it. God had to put a burning bush in front of him. And even then, when God does a whole bunch of stuff in front of him to try and lead him into the value that he's put on the inside of him, and he wants him to make something of the value, what does he do? He starts making excuses. Yeah. I, 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 I can't speak. Sometimes we miss out on what God has provided for us in life because we don't identify, identify value. And when we don't identify value, we put ourselves in a place where we squander our ability to walk into blessing. In Joshua chapter one, God's talking to the Israelites because they're at a place where they're about to walk into the promised land. And he says to Joshua, he says, every place on which your foot shall tread, he says, I've given it to you. I've given it to you. What he was saying was this. If you read the, the chapter, what he was saying was, I've given Israel value. The value that I've given you is a tract of land which runs from the wilderness 
all the way to the Euphrates River. It runs all the way from the land of the Hittites over this side to the Great Sea. He's saying, that's what I'm entrusting to you. That is the value that I'm giving to you. However, the expectation is every place in which your foot shall tread, you're expected to deliver value in that place. Increase on the value. And if you don't do that, you won't inherit. You won't inherit. See, the way that God has designed it is that we walk out our blessing. We don't walk into our blessing. The Israelites had to listen to what God had to say. They had to recognize the value that he had given them and the opportunity that had been created. And they had to take it upon themselves to sit and say, it is my responsibility, understanding kingdom culture and what God is all about, to operate and to move on that and step into a place where what I do is I move into a place where we have influence here. And as a result of influence, we will drive out the giants. We will bring down the walls of Jericho. They had to do it. God never did it for them. If you look at verse seven, it says, be strong and courageous. Strong and courageous. Why? He doesn't say be strong and courageous because they're giants in the land. He knows they're giants in the land. What he was saying to them is be strong and courageous because the thing about it is he knows our natural inclination is to move to a place where what we do is we become sidetracked and we become caught up in the dysfunction as opposed to the value. So what he's saying is stay rooted in the culture. Stay rooted in the principles of the kingdom. Because when you stay rooted in that place, it doesn't matter what you see happening around here. You're going to have to be courageous and step in, identify value and bring about influence because of who you are. Verse 8, it says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Why does he say mouth? What a weird thing to say. This book of the law shall not, that's Old Testament. The equivalent in the New Testament is this. The reason he says mouth is this, because the, what does it say? Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. What he's saying is what comes out of your mouth gives me an indication of what's happening in your heart. The equivalent in the New Testament would be this. When you have rhema from God, keep the rhema from God on your lips all the time. Meditate in it day and night. Seek to do it. Seek to do it. Seek to do it. Seek to take the things. Seek, seek to take the rhema that I've given you. And when you take that rhema and you use it for influence, then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have great success. You will have great success. What happened to the Israelites? A little while back, what ended up happening is God had promised them exactly the same thing, but they sent a whole bunch of spies in to go and have a look at the promised land. And the spies came back and they said, wow, it's lovely and it's everything that God has promised. And they said, it's great and the fruit is great and the land is great and the valleys are great and the landscape is great and the views are great and the sea is great, but there's a giant. In fact, a lot of them. Big, old, nasty, hairy giants. And what happened? What did the people do? They spoke amongst themselves and they thought, they thought anytime you think outside of God's design, what ends up happening is you lose stewardship and you take ownership. I think I can live my life any way I want. You've just taken ownership. I can behave any way I feel. You've just taken ownership. You are not to own it. God never gave it to you. He said you are to steward it. He said you are to steward it. The problem with ownership is this. The moment that you take on ownership, what ends up happening is it prevents you from stepping into blessing because it disconnects you from stewardship, which keeps you connected to the source of life. Anytime you move to that place, what you've just ended up doing is you've sat and said, you know what, I can manage it. And when you say you can manage it, what you've just done is you've started a self audit. Everything becomes about me. And then you start looking at your abilities and your inabilities and your constraints and your limitations and your education and your contacts and your career and your money and your bank account. And then you sit and say, but you can't do it. 
God never called you. Jared, can you turn on the air con a little bit? Jordan, God never called you to own. He called you to steward. Stewardship means I don't own this. It belongs to him. He's given me something of value and I am to take care of it. I am to manage it on his behalf, which is a good thing because when I'm stewarding something, it means that it comes from him. And so every time I need power, every time I need ability, any time I need insight, any time I need wisdom, any time I need favor, what I do is I go to the owner and I say, you own this, Father. Can you give me whatever it is that I'm looking for? And it gives me the opportunity to have influence in that situation. We're to steward, we're not to own. We're to steward, we're not to own. Sarah and I, earlier in the week, Sarah looked at me and she said, you are a fatty daddy. I said, what are you talking about? She said, you, it wasn't that funny when it was that. <laughs> She said, you're just an old stick in the mud. She's like, you come home from work and the kids want just doing stuff and they want to have fun and they're a bit blah, 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 blah. And she said, what do you do? She said, you're just like a wet blanket on everything. And so I thought to myself. And then I stopped. You see, I think you think I tell I come up here to preach to you on Sundays. I actually preach to myself, and I give you a little bit of a window to sit and have a look at it. But I've been meditating on this stuff and thinking about it through the week, and I started thinking about what she was saying. And when you start to think about what she's saying, the thing about it is, my inclination is to think about it and to have a response that says, "Well, you might think that, but I'll tell you what I think." I've just taken ownership of it as opposed to stewarding it. And when you take ownership with it, the problem with it is, at best you're gonna defend, and at worst you're gonna attack. When you take ownership of something, you have to defend who I am. I feel a compulsion, I feel a necessity to try and protect who I am and what my identity is all about. So all of a sudden, I'm about protecting who I am, which means I'm either defensive, which means I don't really hear a single word you're saying because I'm actually looking for a good response to come out, or I'm gonna attack who you are. And so it ends up tit for tat. And so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well now this is new territory for me. And I said, okay, so how do I handle this? And God said, just shut your mouth and listen. You see, when you steward with divine purpose, you recognize the fact that there is a, design, there is a divine plan to things. God says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Okay, that was your opportunity, wives. I even gave you a... He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Not he who finds a woman. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. And the reason it's a good thing is because she's a helpmeet. Because she might see some stuff in your life that you don't see. And her responsibility as a helpmeet is to say, I love you, but actually, you know what? You need to pull your socks up in this area. The problem that we have with so many marriages is that we don't operate out of a stewardship perspective that says what we do is I recognize that God has gifted me with the value of this relationship. And so my response in this relationship is gonna be motivated out of something that's gonna bring about a, an increase in value. What I do is we end up with tit for tat, I think ownership, defensiveness, aggravation, aggression, and fights. And it doesn't take terribly long before you're back at the same place dealing with the same issue all over again. Part of the issue with stewardship is God is not only gonna want to work and giving you the opportunity to take and deliver influence on value and bring about an increase in that. He's working on you 
to sit and say, if you want to step into that, that's fine. I've got to do some stuff in your life to prepare you to step into that. If he doesn't do some stuff on us to move us to where he wants to be, how do we expect that we're going to manage that? If you were to inherit a multi-million dollar company tomorrow, I guarantee you, you would be flustered. Why? Because you're not equipped to handle it. When God starts to do something in your relationship, God is going to move you in some places that you might be uncomfortable with. There's something that is a very, it's very American. There's an American culture. I'll tell you from somebody who's outside. There is a very strong work ethic in America. And let me tell you, it's a good thing. It is a very good thing because it has gone a long way to putting America where it is. However, there is an inherent danger with it. And what ends up happening is it slides our life into function. It slides our life into function. And we become functional in the way that we handle things. And the thing with it is, is that God is sitting saying, fine, I'm going to work on some of that stuff because the part of the, the challenge with function very often is it struggles to deal with anything at an emotive level. Block your ears, dad. This comes from the older generation in particular. It's hard for them to express affection. They get a lot better as they got older. But the truth of it is, you know what? They were so functional in nature that it was difficult for them to express affection. So what ends up happening? You get into a marriage and it becomes functional. You live your life, I live my life, we all live under the roof, the bills are paid, everything's taken care of, but there's no, no intimacy, no glue, or very little that kind of forms the heart of things because it's nice and functional. And then God says, fine, you know what we're gonna do? I'm gonna move you into a new area because what I wanna do is I wanna take that area of value and I wanna make it more expansive and I want it to grow. And because it's gonna grow, it's gonna put you in an uncomfortable place because now one of the things I'm gonna introduce you to is the ability to express affection. Oh, it's so hard. I'm using silly examples. The point that I'm making is this. We talk, about, we talk about living the God life. The truth about the God life is this. God cares for you so much and he believes in you so much. He's taken value and he's filled your life with value. And what he's doing is he's trying to introduce you to value. He's trying to introduce you so that you see the value in the circumstances and the situations, in the people and in the, in the opportunities that confront you. Even some of the conflicts have, uh, have value attached to them. And what he's trying to say to you is, I want you to use those as springboards because when you take the principles of the kingdom and you put them into operation and you begin to effectively steward the value that I've given you, with divine purpose, what ends up happening is your situation is going to change and it's going to increase as a result of your influence, but it's going to start to do something on you as well. And it's going to start growing you up, it's going to start expanding you out, and it's going to start preparing you for what it is that you're going to start inheriting. And your life becomes bigger and richer and fuller and more rewarding as a result of it. We learn how to work with God, we learn how to manage our lives, we understand the diversity in which we find ourselves, and we put ourselves in a place where God sits and says, you know what, because you've done so well in small things, I'm going to introduce you to some more stuff. If you want to fill your life even more, start doing really well with the value that you have in your life.